Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne and Tracy Miller. It's January 2nd, 1982. Joan Stewart is raped, strangled, stabbed several times, and murdered in the woodlands near Montclair, California. It was the work of the East Bay Slayer. Charles Jackson started his lifetime career of crime when he was arrested and charged with theft at age 16. Over the next 28 years, he is repeatedly incarcerated for committing burglary, rape, assault, and molesting minors. After Jackson died in prison in 2002, Authorities learned he slayed more than eight people because of the tenacity of Deputy District Attorney Rock Harmon's pursuit of DNA profiling. Welcome to Behind the Crime Scene, where we go beyond the yellow tape and into the lives of first responders, investigators, and prosecutors who work true crime. I'm Gina Osborne, retired FBI assistant special agent in charge and former Army counterintelligence agent. And I'm Tracy Miller. I've been a prosecutor for over 23 years, having tried over 80 jury trials, including some of the most violent cases involving gang cases, juvenile sexual assault cases, and domestic violence cases. And on today's show, we are talking about the East Bay Slayer with Rock Harmon. And Gina, this case upsets me so much because one of his victims was an 11-year-old little girl who was playing with her kitty cat. I know, that's terrible. That is terrible. But the fascinating thing about this whole thing is our guest became an expert, a pioneer in DNA forensics. So I was one of his law clerks. I worked with him on the O.J. Simpson case where, you know, DNA was a big deal because it was thought as the, the introductory case that the nation watched to see how DNA worked. And Rock and Woody Clark, who later was a San Diego DA and later became a superior court judge in San Diego, we called him the Rock and Woody Show. Mm. And they would come and they would teach us about, we didn't know what DNA was. I'd never even heard of it. And they would teach us about the DNA evidence. And he really has made a career out of helping prosecutors prove cases through DNA science. What I like about him is the fact that he was a Naval Academy graduate in 1967. He spent four years on active duty where he did a tour in Vietnam and he was awarded the Purple Heart. And he's lectured and he's taught at universities. And he received an award from the FBI director for his efforts in their first decade of DNA typing to actually solve some of these crimes where people for years didn't know who killed their loved one. And he was a deputy district attorney with the county of Alameda for over three decades. And when he became an expert in DNA, he traveled the country helping prosecutors explain this science to 12 jurors. So let's go behind the crime scene with Rock Harmon on the East Bay Slayer case. Welcome to the show, Rock. I've been telling Gina all week how excited I am to have one of my mentors from law school as a guest. I learned so much from you, and you really are an icon in the district attorney and the scientific world. So it's an honor. Today we're talking to you about the Charles Jackson serial killer case. Can you tell us how you first got involved? Yeah, it's it's actually, you know, the best story and the coolest thing I've ever done in my legal career. So thanks for asking about it. Rock, this case started for you when Charles Jackson, also known as the East Bay Slayer, raped, strangled, and stabbed a San Francisco City College professor named Joan Stewart. What do you remember about that day? The murder of Joan Stewart happened in early January of 1981. And try not to think about how old you were then. Um, I was a lot younger, Rock. So was Gina. (laughs) So by then I'd been a DA for a little over six years. And I remember reading in the newspaper that this professor was murdered. I had been at the main courthouse trying some felonies, lower grade, and the head of the office, a great guy like Howard Jansen, they had arrested somebody pretty quickly. And Howard said, they're going to have a lineup tonight. Why don't you go there? And I'd never been to a lineup, so I said, sure. And one thing led to another. The investigator knew me, and they just said, hey, you're here. Go along for the ride. You're part of this case now. 
it's yours to see what happened in the accounting. So I was at the lineup, and before I knew it, I was deep in with the investigators because things were happening very fast. We had no real eyewitnesses. Where did this murder take place? This happened on a, a like a, a, wood, a road with no houses on it until you got higher up the hill. It's in a hilly area of Oakland. And during that day, people had seen an old Cadillac with the big fins on it with brown primer spots all over it. And so a number of people had seen the car all around the place, generally in that time period, either moving or parked near where Joan Stewart's body was found. And so the reason for the lineup was that one of the then middle school girls, he had stopped to offer her a ride, and she was the only witness to be called to the lineup because a beat cop in Oakland had seen a car matching the description. It's a pretty distinct car detained the guy actually he came out of this building and wanted to know what she was stopping for she ran and realized he was on parole for rape turned out very near nearby where the murder occurred and so he was asked if he would go down to the police station talk to the police who participated in the lineup so the the, the lineup was only to see if this one girl could identify him as she did but that's where the case began to come together, and it came together very slowly. Fortunately, he had a parole hold that entitled us to hold him for more than 48 hours before we had to charge him. In those first few days, we were able to piece together enough evidence to charge him. Tell us about the evidence they found that linked Charles Jackson to Joan Stewart. Joan Stewart was coming back from the grocery store. She had a bag of groceries, and they spilled. She was pushed off the side of the road down a hillside, and she was murdered down down there on the way. So her, her purse and the grocery bag were strewn around. And I remember looking at the pictures, and there's something on top of her purse or wallet. It was like a piece of paper. I said, what's that? And go, it turns out. It was a piece of Canadian bacon. And it was in those diner napkins, the Sierra dispensers on a diner counter. We were having some trouble timing everything. Well, where did she buy the Canadian bacon then? Where did that fit in? Because it didn't come from the grocery store. Well, she was a vegetarian. Hmm. That wasn't hers. So his mom was a very religious, nice person. So we went to visit her. And she talked to us, and she would talk to you about anything. And it got around to, oh, she would make him breakfast. He stayed there most of the time. What would you make him? Sausage, bacon, Canadian bacon. Now, I don't know if you ever had Canadian bacon. I did when I was a kid. My mom would treat us once in a while. But that's not something a lot of people have very often. So my investigator, I thought he was going daffy on me. (laughs) I've never seen Canadian bacon. What does it look like? So she goes to the freezer and gets, it's a piece of a big long roll of something. In this instance, Canadian bacon. She would buy the big thing and then she would slice it up and, you know, whenever she was going to use it. So we made a connection between him and Canadian bacon and the murder scene. And because it was on top of it, Mm -hmm. it obviously had to have come into that position at some point after she was pushed down the hill. So that's why those things are, you know, I learned from some good people early on, just keep plugging away. The little things like that have a way of materializing when you have a couple of other things to build your case around. Back in the early 80s, DNA hadn't evolved to where it is today. So what evidence was found from the crime scene that you were able to use to shore up your case? What we need, in the DNA era, this case would have been a slam dunk. But this was 1981, about eight years before we had our first DNA case. And nobody was even talking about DNA then. So when he was arrested, he had a blue windbreaker on. On his windbreaker, there were some stains. She had had her throat cut on the sleeve of 
her jacket that she was wearing, there were also some stains. The laboratory, given what we were able to do then, all the laboratory could tell you was the stains had a similar combination of biological material. Obviously, women don't have sperm in, in their bodily secretion, so the presence of sperm on her was material. The presence of sperm on the front of his jacket and the com combination of ABO types. Because in, in the old days, you couldn't separate the sperm out from the other cellular material and then produce separate typing results like you can do with DNA. We interviewed all the people that were a lineup, in a lineup with him and got some cryptic comments that he made to them. That was pretty much it. So I was feeling pretty wound up as the year went by thinking how are we going to make this case stronger and so you see his criminal record if you actually look at his parole records you realize that he's hardly ever out of prison in fact if you make a timeline a personal timeline for him you realize that you know his periods of freedom were 30, 50, 100 days. So at, at my suggestion, the, the main investigator from the Oakland Police Department, Bernie Matthews, sent out a teletype to all law enforcement agencies in the Bay Area. Told them what we had. We said, do you have any throat cut and or strangulation murders that happened in any of these windows when he was free? And as I said, they, they were narrow windows. They've eliminated probably 80 to 90% of the time. It was breathtaking to see what we got back because the answer was yes. There were incredible numbers of these things that happened. And not only were there a good number of them, there was one that happened in 1975 just up the hillside from where his car was parked. We talked about it as it was the bend of the road. That case was a doctor's wife who was murdered while her husband was away fishing for the day. And a man was seen running down the hill down to where this guy parked his car during our 1981 murder. But it was breathtaking to actually see the stuff that was out there that nobody could do anything with or had done anything with. But it was even more breathtaking to keep pulling those cases and to see that his name had come up back in those days. Basically, uh, this guy would get out on short stints of prison time and yeah. go and commit other crimes and kill people during these very brief breaks. Yeah, I think we came up with about five or six. It became more striking when you realize that the Bay Area, you know, we have a number of different counties here and, and, and a lot of towns that just butt up against each other. His freedom usually ended during daytime residential burglaries in the same area that one of these murders occurred. Wow. So, so for example, there was a murder in Castro Valley that we were unable to find any biological evidence with that he was arrested soon after that murder doing daytime residential murders at Castro Valley. The same with El Cerrito, which is Contra Costa County. There was a daytime murder that happened, and that period of freedom ended when he was arrested doing burglaries there. I mean, think about somebody doing all this stuff in the daytime. That's crazy. This guy was a handyman. He was a very handy guy. He worked really hard. And so what we saw in a number of these cases is there was a guy like him driving a beat-up old light truck going door-to-door -door looking for work. And that's how he got to your door. And if you were a woman and you opened it, you were dead. Yeah. It was as simple as that. The rape conviction that he got in 1975, a tree had fallen down. And he went to this lady's house to see if she'd pay him to cut up the tree and haul it away. The unsolved one that we had in Castro Valley where we could never come up with any biological evidence, there was that white truck driving around the neighborhood looking for work. Couldn't have written a crazier story than the truth presented us. As I said, in the DNA era, this would have been a slam dunk, but this wasn't the DNA.
Did you get we, a conviction we, in that trial? Yeah, we did. Just in this case, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, there was, you know, every case there's usually something really strong. This was just, it was, it was unbelievable. What was he charged with? He was charged with capital murder in light of his criminal history because the rape that he was on parole for, that actually happened just up the hill from where the murder occurred in 1975. So he liked his areas and stayed there. But what's interesting to me is the fact that from the time he was put into prison until the time he died, you were able to do something with the DNA in order to show that he had done all of these other murders. Can you tell us a little bit about that? We had our first cases in Alameda County in 89 and 90. So the idea that DNA is new, that just wasn't true. You know, we were all too busy with new cases to think about old cases, but I really never forgot the cases that that we had come across with him because there were many others that I had or other people had we went back and revisited. But after OJ, I remember thinking, what am I going to do now? I said, I want to look at old cases. And so we started digging them out. And in those days, there wasn't a lot of money to do. It was hard enough to get lab work done on a new case. It was like pulling teeth to get it done on old cases, particularly when nobody was complaining about it. Nobody was suggesting to go back and look at all the old cases. But, you know, by probably the late 90s, which is that's when we started with looking at other cases, but also these cases. We had kind of a roadmap because they involved the Sheriff's Department, the Oakland Police Department, El Cerrito Police Department. I don't know, I've left somebody out. But but most of them were from Oakland, which is where this guy's family lives. But, you know, remember, he was doing life without parole then. Right. So So did you get pushback for even looking into these cases or spending money on it since he was not going to get any more punishment? To a certain extent, yep. It was hard to prioritize them. To their credit, we used almost exclusively private labs because the government labs were still getting up to speed with this. And it was hard, in those days, it was hard to get the FBI to take these cases. I think all of them were done by private labs where police departments paid. It took about five years to go through all of them. And it was hard. It was hard to keep it a secret and not tell victims' families and things like that, too. But we wanted to finish everything and be in a position to go for it when when we had done everything we wanted to do. So the cases that you identified, uh, Sonia Higginbotham, she was raped and stabbed in her home in Oakland. Anna Johnson, who was 27, she was the wife. You know what? Once you read off each one, and I'll tell you more stuff about him. So the Sonia Higginbotham, she lived just down the road from Jackson's mom. That's mm-hmm. how this how crazy this is that when you suddenly got that hook, then you say, Holy cow, I can't believe this. Ann Johnson was the doctor's wife. She lived just up the hill from where he parked his car during the Joan Stewart murder, six years apart. How about Henry and Edith Villa? Yeah, that one, I, I, I forgot, Albany, that's another department, that's Alameda County, and that was an odd one because it was a couple, and we had no real connection between him and Albany, which is a smaller town adjacent to Berkeley. And Betty Jo Grunsvig? Betty Jo Grunsvig. I remember that case when it happened because I was working with Homicide a lot, and it's just a few days apart from the next one you're going to tell me about. Gail, yeah. yeah. And I think they're four or five days apart. And it turned out that during the Jackson investigation, we found that he had gotten a traffic citation in his distinctive Cadillac the same night that Betty Grun's wife was murdered, not that far away. And we can't forget Cynthia Waxman. Right, and that one just came out of left field in the sense. I mean, this is the beauty of CODIS. You don't have to think anybody did did it. But CODIS provides a tremendous advantage, be, incentive because even if you think it's somebody and it's not them, then you have CODIS as a fallback. And that's what happened with Cynthia Waxman. There was another guy named Philip Hughes who had killed some young girls in the Alameda Contra Costa area. And so 
unbeknownst to me, kind of Contra Costa knew that we were working Charles Jackson because they did some work on the El Cerrito case that I, that I mentioned. Uh, but they thought they were going to come up with Phil Hughes in that, and they didn't. They got a, a cold hit on Charles Jackson in the Cynthia Waxman case. I want to point out that Cynthia Waxman was only 11 years old, and Jackson got her while she was playing out alone in a field. So, Rock, Jackson died of a heart attack in prison in 2002, so you couldn't bring charges against him for all of these murders you identified. However, you cared so much about these victims, you fought hard to bring closure to their families. Can you tell us about the Grunsvig case? At the very beginning, the police thought, that her strange husband killed her. I mean, that's typical early on when you got nothing else, you start in close and see where it takes you. I knew that because I remembered the case. And so as soon as we found out that Jackson had died, this was 18 years later, we had to find Kenneth Grunswag to tell him that we knew he didn't kill his wife. Hmm. You brought him some peace. Uh, totally. So we found him, and he was so appreciative. He had remarried, unbeknownst to me, he had cancer. Mm. So that was pretty satisfying. You must yeah, have been so rewarding. Well, there's a book called The Geography of Love. Ken's wife, who I'm still friends with, she's a, an author, and she wrote this book that me doing this for them is just a small part it's more the relationship how the especially those last times evolved yeah i'm still friends with her son so it's sad how we have to make friends in this business isn't it yeah it is brock how did you become a pioneer when it comes to dna science right in the middle of all this stuff in fact I mentioned we had some biological evidence in the Jackson case, and I didn't know anything about that stuff then. And there was a little flicker of question by the defense attorney that I thought, what the hell is this guy talking about? And then about probably 85, I was asked if I would handle this triple murder case that arose out of the LSD business and the key issue was the admissibility of the biological evidence testing that we used to do before DNA. So I sure, you know, so I remembered the case. It was the murders were in 79. And so I said, sure. And, and you know, I worked hard, did a good job, got the guy convicted. And we had admissibility here. And I thought that was the end of it. By then it was 87, probably. That's about when I met my buddy Woody Clark. Hmm who was just straying into the same stuff down in San Diego. I started getting invited by people, especially the FBI, to come and talk at meetings about this, because I was the only one that seemed interested in stuff. And 87 is when they start talking about DNA, and there I was. So it was just one of those things, you know, you, we both, we all see that in different professions that you just do something right and it becomes a, something that's important. So, you know, my case became the legal precedence, case called People versus Lawrence Riley. But I was just there in the beginning and I had a great boss believe that if we can help people, we should help people. And so he freed me up. My trial career ended back then because I was so busy doing stuff and helping other people. L.A. is not the only county I went and stuff for, but, um, yeah, it was just one of those opportunities. You do a good job, and then you get to help other people, and it becomes a big deal. So I know so many prosecutors, Rock, that you have helped throughout your career, and it's so fun to reconnect with you because I met you helping me and these yeah. victims, especially the victims of this horrible, horrible murderer, Charles Jackson, you helped yeah. them have closure. So thank yeah. you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. That's how I met Marsha Clark on the phone. I had never met her before. OJ, she had a case. She's pretty smart, so she doesn't need a lot of help. But just having somebody who's got all the answers was helpful to her. Thank you so much for being on our show today. 
I mean, you see why of, of all the stuff I've ever done, you realize how many flukes had to occur for that to happen. Yeah. Sure. You know, it's just, it's really incredible to just say, I kept being in the right place at the right time. Wow, Gina, that brought memories back. Rock, um, I haven't actually talked to him in years, but I'm, he's very big on social media in the DA world and the forensic scientist world. And it brought back a lot of memories of um, when he taught me so much when I was 24 years old. You know what I loved about him is he just didn't give up. He saw that there are all these other women who had been killed and they, all of these other cases came up and he could have just gone on after the O.J. Simpson case and done new cases, but instead it stuck in his mind to go back with all of the DNA experience that he had to find justice for these victims. And it's interesting because sometimes our jobs get political and there's political pushback and it seemed like he, he definitely said he got pushback because he wasn't going to get any more time for this a serial killer. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going to get the death penalty. He wasn't going to get any more time. But the most emotional rock got on this interview when he was talking about clearing um, the husband mm -hmm. who had been blamed for killing his wife. So even time isn't the only thing in these cases. It's bringing clarity and justice and answers to the people's lives that have been destroyed by these violent crimes. And I love the fact that a book was written a love story was written between the victim and her husband who had been accused of her murder i think that's great we're gonna have to look that one up and we are the writer in you i knew as soon as he said that i'm like oh gina's gonna read that oh my gosh <laughs> i think that's i mean what i mean it's just so profound to me it's so profound i think when beautiful things come out of something so ugly and rock Harmon tried this capital case four times unbelievable he did the cap the penalty phase twice he had to go back and retry the oral copulation part. Trying a capital case is exhausting. It takes, we always think, years off our lives. But he didn't quit. He didn't. Even when the judge nailed him for contempt. <laughs> well, he is a very <laughs> strong advocate. He's someone I've always wanted on my side. So who cares about that contempt hearing? He got justice. We're taking our show on the road. We're speaking at nonprofit events. We speak at corporate events. And we speak live or on Zoom, and we talk about the life lessons that we've both learned from our careers and the life lessons we've learned from our guests. Sometimes we think we've learned it all. Mm -hmm. We've been at the top of our careers, large and in charge, mm -hmm. and these guests teach us so much, sometimes not about crime, but about life. And that's what we share with our audiences, whether we apply it to leadership or team building, collaboration, Connecting and dealing with chaos. Exactly. Empowerment, all of those things. Find us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and subscribe. Go to your favorite podcast provider and subscribe to us. And also visit us at our website at BehindTheCrimeScene.com. We'll see you next time, Behind the Crime Scene. Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne and Tracy Miller is produced and edited by Lisa Osborne. Theme music is Insomnia by retired IRS Special Agent Clarissa Balmaceda. Find us on social media through BehindTheCrimeScene.com. And don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne and Tracy Miller wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lisa Osborne.